Um, good evening, everyone. It's um, a pleasure to see you all here for my master class. Um, we're going to talk about the regulatory assessment of the Bitcoin Lightning Network under Swiss law. So I'm, I'm going to make try to make this not overly legal and also uh, try to bring the matter a bit closer to you. It's an intermediate class. I'm not sure what's your background. Um, maybe a bit um, on myself and who I'm representing. So my name is Michael. I'm a lawyer, legal partner at MME. It's a S Swiss law firm with offices in Zug and Zurich. Um, before I joined MME, actually in 2014, uh, the, the firm incorporated uh, the Ethereum Foundation and also organized the first uh, ICO ever, so the Ethereum ICO in 2015. And so I had the privilege, I would say, to work with some truly astounding projects in the crypto space in the last few years. Now, as many of you will see, I'm um, easily that many of those projects that I'm showing here have very little to do with Bitcoin. So most of the clients we work with are actually developing on Ethereum or other um, smart contract platforms. So I say this for two reasons. So first of all, I'm really excited to be here uh, to do a little uh, deep dive on, on Bitcoin. The other is also I don't have a perfect technical understanding of how these things work. So if you see that there is anything is wrong, you know, please let me know. And um, I'm, I may also you know, point out if I have a technical question to you guys, so whenever I say I'm not sure about this, I'm actually happy if you take a mental note and tell me after the class so um, I also can learn something. So maybe to get started, um, we all know that Bitcoin Network is the longest running and largest block in the world, and that it's an amazing store of value. But Bitcoin does have a few shortcomings. Um, you can say it's, it's one or two. I would say one we can all agree on is that Bitcoin does have a scalability problem like many other blockchains. Um, and this shows in, in the fact that Bitcoin as a network is very slow and transactions are comparatively expensive. Now, this has two consequences. First of all, it cannot be used easily for everyday transactions. And the other thing, it cannot be used for micropayments. The second challenge, uh, you know, some people see, and some in this group may not agree with this, is that Bitcoin has uh, very limited use cases. So again, it's a very good store of value. And it is a good payment system in a, in a sense, but it really um, stops there. So some people argue that adoption would be much better if actually use cases like DeFi would come to Bitcoin. And you see this in, um, in an indication that around 1% of all Bitcoin are currently wrapped and actually used for DeFi or other purposes on the Ethereum blockchain. So when you look at the scalability problem, it's something that you all have seen, the scalability trilemma that a lot of blockchains face. It's not a Bitcoin-only problem, but um, I think Bitcoin is a very good example for the existence of the problem. So the key idea behind the scalability trilemma is that a blockchain cannot be at the same time scalable, secure, and decentralized. And I think we can all agree that Bitcoin falls on arrow C. It's very secure, it's very decentralized, but it is not yet at least very scalable. Now this shows in various ways. So Bitcoin transaction blocks are rather small. So they have a size of up to four megabytes. I think I heard officially it's one megabyte, but um, recently there have been blocks that have been much larger. Um, another issue that Bitcoin has is that it can only process three to seven transactions per second, approximately. And I'm not sure if Visa is honest when they say they can process 65,000 transactions per second, but I think we can all uh, <laughs> acknowledge that um, three to seven transactions is not enough to be a global settlement layer. One of the biggest issues I would personally see is that um, these tr new transaction blocks are only added every 10 minutes, which makes, makes it very difficult to use Bitcoin at a point of sale, right? Because if you pay for a coffee or you want to pay in a supermarket, you don't want to ten make uh, wait 10 minutes until the, the person tells you that the payment has actually arrived. And the last issue is that the average transaction cost on Bitcoin is rather expensive with $2. You know, it depends on what the purpose is, but again, for micropayments, you can not really use the Bitcoin network. Now, there's two different uh, approaches to the scalability problem. One we have seen play out live in 2017 when um, Bitcoin Cash was created as, as part of the segre uh, segregated witness update where they wanted to increase the block size from one megabyte to eight megabytes. So they have achieved, accomplished doing this. I'm not really sure if this has solved their problems, scalability issues, um, but it's clear that Bitcoin didn't want to go that way. At least the core, the core community didn't want to do this. So now, um, communication or conversation is really more focusing on actually using a layer two solution, which means that you want to take a part of the transactions and actually settle them off chain. Now, one of these uh, layer two solutions that we know very well also from the Ethereum uh, um, ecosystem is the Lightning Network. 
And so the main idea of the Lightning Network is, is the following. It wants to achieve three things. So first of all, it wants to be a network with high volume. So it wants to have a large amount of transactions. The transaction should be instantaneous, which means the transaction time should be very short. And it should allow for micropayments, which means it needs to have very low transaction fees. Now, as I mentioned, the transactions, they are processed and stored outside of the Bitcoin network, which um, has the, the good side effect that they do not require block confirmations, but because it actually settles eventually on the network, it can still benefit from the security of the Bitcoin network. We're going to look at that in a second. Now, what's important is that um, the Lightning Network actually inherits the core principles of the Bitcoin network in that it is permissionless, so everybody can participate without requiring an authorization by anyone. It's decentralized. It doesn't have a central operator. It's non-custodial, at least depending on the solution you choose, but at least you can use it in a non-custodial manner. And it is open source, which is something that I think is very important. I'm not sure exactly what the role of Lightning Labs is and you know how much they are actually controlling the development. But the good thing at least is that they're open sourcing all their code under the MIT license, which is a very permissive license and allows pretty much anyone to do everything, anything they want with the code. Now the core question for this presentation is, does the participation in the Lightning Network trigger any financial market regulations? And in order to understand the question and be able to answer it, we have to look at the key components of the network. So on the one hand, we have the Lightning Nodes. The Lightning Nodes are, technically speaking, they're software instances that are running on a computer or a, or a cell phone. But what they're doing is they, they kind of are connected to one another and they are the the thing that allows people to actually participate in the network and both send and receive Bitcoin. Um, the Lightning Network, as I said, is decentralized and it's made up entirely of these nodes um, that are connected to one another. The second key component is payment channels. And I think that's really the unique factor of um, the Lightning Network because nodes we know as a concept from blockchains and other, other layer two solutions, but payment channels are you know, seemingly unique to this setup. And basically what happens is that people pay from node to node, but the payment channels are basically the roads that the payments take to get from A to B. Now payment channels are created, opened, and closed on the Bitcoin network. But anything that happens between opening and closing is actually off-chain and does not need to touch the Bitcoin network, which is also why it can actually um, you know, transact these uh, process these transactions so fast and so cheaply. The last thing is the invoices. So invoices are um, requests for payment. So basically when I want to pay in the Lightning Network, the recipient sends an invoice and says, this is basically all you need to know. It's usually in a QR code and tells you everything you need to know, the amount, the payment duration, the expiry date, and um, allows you to just scan it and pay. The reason why invoices are important is because it signals that this is really meant to be a payment system and not just a side effect. Now, if you want to participate in the Lightning Network, you have various options. The one option is to operate your own network node. Now, I'm actually curious. I want to ask the audience, who of you operates a Lightning node? OK, that's uh, around a third. It's more than I thought. Um, that's, uh, that's really great. So I actually tried to um, run a node myself on Ethereum once. I wanted to. Uh, I actually gave up and it was also too unsafe for me at one point because the issue is obviously it has some complexities that come with it and it's not for everyone. The benefit is you can use your own private key and actually sign transactions, send the transactions independently to the network and you can also open and manage your own payment channels, which as we will see is quite important. Now, if you don't want to operate your own node, you can also use a Bitcoin Lightning wallet. And like most wallets that we have in the crypto space, these are either custodial or non-custodial. So I have mentioned it here, no, not your keys, not your coins. So that's always a consideration to make, right? If you want to use a custodial wallet, that's fine. But you are going to be exposed to a counterparty risk that the money is going to be lost. Now, but I think in this, in this context, another thing that matters between choosing a custodial and non-custodial wallet is that non-custodial wallets allow you to set up your own payment channels. Whereas custodial wallets usually just attach you to the node operator and allow you to use the operator's existing channels. Now talking about channels, which I think, as I, as I said before, are the most important part, is that there's actually only two transactions that really touch the blockchain, as I mentioned, and anything in between is off-chain. Now, you can imagine, for those of you who don't really, cannot really imagine you know, why this is done, it's a bit like having a tab in a bar 
or you go with friends and have a, a holiday, you know, a weekend trip, and you basically open an IOU and you basically say, everybody adds their expense and then we just settle at the end of the weekend. Or basically, I add all my drinks and then I just settle when I leave the bar. It's kind of the same concept, right? You basically start, you have a funding transaction where you have to find at least one person that wants to open a payment channel with you. So basically, the first thing you need is to have somebody else who opens a channel between you and them. Now, there's various ways how you can do this. I personally have not done it, so I assume that there's kind of default automated versions to do this. But you can also um, use the Lightning Terminal, which allows you to find you know, good peers that are reliable. Now, what really happens is that when you found a partner, both of you have committed a certain amount of funds, and um, those funds are locked on the Bitcoin network. And so do those funds together represent the capacity of the payment channel. Now, those funds are held cooperatively which means they can only be moved if both parties agree that they are moved. Now, once the channel is open, you can make as many transactions as you want. And those transactions are very free and very cheap. And I would even say probably if it's just really between the two people of the, of the payment channel, it's probably even free, presumably. Um, now, these are the actual payments in the channel, and they're not broadcast to the Bitcoin network. And once you're done, you know, the weekend's over the bar, you know, the evening in the bar ends, you say, I'm going to close my channel, this closing transaction resolves the final balance and um, releases the committed funds on the Bitcoin network. Another reason why it, uh, the channel could close is because one party drops and then you all have an automated closure. Now, I found this online. And here, a shout out to Findmatics, which I think is a, a pretty cool resource for you know, all things crypto. It's actually really easily explained. So Alice and Bob, they get together and they say, let's actually create a payment channel and we both commit 0 0.02 Bitcoin and um, once we actually made that funding transaction, the channel is open. And then we can use and we can make all types of transactions between us. Now, obviously, the, the capacity of the channel is limited. And as we said before, it's here. Each of them gave 0 0.02, so the capacity is 0 0.04. So that's kind of like how wide the channel is. So anything that's wider than that cannot go through. Now, when they're done, they can do a closing transaction and they can go their separate ways. And depending on how many times they actually interact with each other, they get, you know, the amount left that they are due. Now, what's really interesting about the Lightning Network is that you don't only just have these payment channels, but you can actually also use routing, which means you don't need to be connected to the person that you pay. So as an example, when you go to McDonald's and they accept Lightning payments in the Lightning Network, you don't need to say, okay, you know, let's now open a channel and then I can actually send you. Instead, they say that's all great because we are probably both connected to channels that, that to nodes that know one another. And so in a way, like on Facebook, you know, you know, friend knows a friend knows a friend, the payment will eventually get there. Now, an important part of that, you know, concept is the defining of the right transaction path. And that's similar than, you know, um, aggregators like one inch on Ethereum that find, try to find the best way, the cheapest way to actually get to the goal. Here it's just, instead of basically buying stuff on, uh, on DeFi, it's really just making a payment to find out what's the best way to send that money to the recipient with the shortest route and the lowest fees. Now, I would assume that the fees are more important than the route. But again, it's a technical question, so maybe you can answer that to me later. Um, and the last thing that is uh, interesting is that it uses the so-called onion routing technique, which you know from the Tor browser. And the, the good side effect of that is that you don't actually, um, uh, if you're, in the middle of a transaction, you don't know who's sending the transaction, who's getting it, how many stops there are. All you know is your par, your portion of the route. And that's really good for privacy. Now here again, I have found a visualization from Findmatics that really shows easily if I want to pay, let's call him Ale, um, well, um, Alice to Bob. Um, she, uh, she wants to make the payment. And so the, the node of Alice figures out what's the best way to get there. Now in this visualization, you only see there's actually only one route. And I think what's important here is to see that you have here and here and here you have capacity limitations. So if Alice wants to send a Bitcoin, but these payment challenges, actually one of them only has a capacity of 0 0.9 Bitcoin, it doesn't work, right? So she actually has to split the transaction and send two different payments. Now, after looking how routing works, I think the best way to illustrate how it really looks like is to look at the specific transaction. And I use a simplified transaction without fees, um, as you will see now. Now, what's important, what I haven't mentioned before, is that these uh, payments are atomic, which means they either work or they don't. And that's really essential, right? Because when there's many parties in between, 
not anyone in there can just say, oh, well, that's great, I take my payment and I'm leaving. It's either it goes from A to, in this case, from Alice to Eric, or it doesn't. And so this is a pretty simple example, but I think it's, and it's ex important for the, for the legal assessment later, where you see that there's five participants, so Alice wants to pay to Eric. There's no direct channel, so she actually has to route it through Bob, Carol, and Diana. And so each of them have set up a payment channel with their neighbor. So Alice has only one channel, two and two. So she gave two and two Bitcoin and Bob gave two Bitcoin. And the channel therefore has a capacity of four. Now Alice only owns two Bitcoin because she only has one open channel. Bob on the other hand and Carol and Diana, they each have two Bitcoin on each side. And that's why they own more Bitcoin, right? But all these channels, they are the same. And what happens when the payment is made from Alice to Eric and she pays one Bitcoin, there's actually very little that changes. So obviously one thing that changes is that Alice now only has one Bitcoin and Eric has three. So that's the point of the, the transaction. But it also impacted the two payment channels to which Alice and Eric are connected. So the payment channel of Alice got reduced by one because one Bitcoin out of that channel was actually sent to Eric. And the payment channel between Eric and Diana increased by one. Now that only affects Alice and Eric. So even though Bob and Diana are connected to the payment channel, you can see that they still own the same amount of funds. So what has actually increased here is the capacity of the channel, but not the amount of money that Diana owns, just the amount of money that Eric owns. So this begs the question, if Bitcoin are locked on the blockchain and are not moved until the closing transaction is processed, what is actually sent from Alice to Eric? Because the Bitcoin don't move. And this you know, thought construct is important to understand from a legal perspective. And it was introduced um, by uh, my colleague Fabio Andreotti. He's head of legal at Bitcoin Swiss. Shout out to him as well. Um, there's actually something that he calls a LN, or Lightning Network Bitcoin. It doesn't really exist, but something does move between the participants. Right, it's a ledger entry, it's a value, name it whatever you want, but something does move around. It's not the Bitcoin itself. And so the concept of LMBTC helps us to understand that actually the object that's being transferred, we call it LMBTC, does actually move around. So because Alice has only one, because one from a payment channel was actually moved to the payment channel to which Eric was connected. So oh, technically seen, LMBTC are equivalent to Bitcoin, they have the same value. And functionally, they represent a promise to deliver Bitcoin that was locked on chain. So Eric has one LM BTC more, which means that when he closes a channel, he gets three Bitcoin and not just two. This is, as we will see, relevant for the, for the legal assessment. Now, before we get there, a few statistics. There are, as of yesterday, around 15,000 nodes. So participants in the network that are able to send and receive transactions. There are many more channels. There's approximately four channels per node. And the reason for that is that the more channels you have, the more you are connected, right? If you only have one channel to one person that also has only one channel, chance is that you're not gonna be connected to you know, a farmer in El Salvador. But um, if you have a lot of channels and he has a lot of channels, then that actually increases, which also makes it more useful as a payment system. Now, uh, one interesting metric, I think, is the network capacity overall of 5,000, approximately 400 Bitcoin. It's $150 million. It sounds like a lot. It's not that much. It's actually 27 times less than Bitcoin that is wrapped on Ethereum. But I think it actually doesn't really matter because we have to keep in mind that the Lightning Network was made for micropayments that are, trans, um, that are processed instantaneously. And so, the network capacity is really much less relevant than the number of nodes, because I think if there's hundreds of thousands of people that participate in the network and that making micropayments, it really doesn't matter whether there exist payment channels that have a capacity of 100 Bitcoin. But on the other hand, it also shows that the Lightning Network is probably not very useful to send large transactions, but it also doesn't need to be, right? Because we've seen the transaction cost of, uh, on Bitcoin is right now around $2. If I want to send 50 Bitcoin to somebody else, I'm more than happy to pay $2 to actually settle that transaction on the, on the, on the blockchain itself. Now, last but not least, use cases. So we have a few theoretical use cases. Obviously, the obvious one is accepting Bitcoin at a point of sale. Um, another thing is also private transaction. And private, I mean concealed transactions between Alice and Bob. 
as long as they don't open a payment channel that goes directly to them. And the last thing is money streaming, which I think is an interesting use case because we're very much used to subscriptions where we pay annually or monthly. It doesn't matter how often we watch Netflix, we just pay by the month. Um, you can pay per view, I mean, that's something we know, but kind of pay per minute or pay per hour, we don't really know yet. And the reason why that is, is that we just don't really have the tools that allow us to actually do this. Same for, you know, payments. I've heard that, you know, in 2017, people talked about that, you know, work and get paid by the second. I'm not sure if it's really going to happen, but I think at least as, a, as an idea, it's, um, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty cool. Now, practical examples, we have a few. So we have Shopify has, uh, that has integrated Strike, which itself has integrated the, the, the Lightning Network. So if you open a shop on Shopify, you can actually accept Bitcoin in the uh, through the Lightning Network, which is pretty awesome to buy goods and sell services. Now, um, another use case is Cash App, which I think is even cooler because it actually just allows you to send money without um, receiving anything in return. So that's really just like a direct payment tool that can be used for remittances and others. And obviously, Lugano's Plan B, as they announced this morning, uh, makes use of the Lightning Network and uh, will soon allow everybody to pay all the invoices from the city in Bitcoin and Tether and using the Lightning Network as well. But I think there's also two limitations that are really important. Um, first of all, the usability depends on the number and the quality of the nodes to which you're connected and therefore the payment channels. So if you have a, an address on the Bitcoin blockchain, people can just pay you and anybody can just pay you. It doesn't really matter who they are connected to. Everybody's connected to everybody. And that actually is, a, is much easier in, in reality, especially as long as there's not millions of users. And the other thing is that it's obvious that if you want to pay a Bitcoin, you can only pay a Bitcoin if you have locked the Bitcoin, right? That, that makes sense. But, and I might be wrong here, tell me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is if you want to receive a Bitcoin, you need to be attached to a payment channel that has a capacity of a Bitcoin as well. Now, if you just want to give 0 0.01 Bitcoin and somebody else gives the rest, that's great, but I'm not sure a lot of people are going to be willing to do this. So it's, you actually need to lock up money to receive money. And that is, again, if I'm wrong, please tell me, but I think that's a, a pretty important limitation. Now, talking about limitations and use cases. So as I mentioned before, the Bitcoin network has not been known in the past for being extremely um, um, active when it comes to development and upgrades. I think one of the core um, feature really is that it's actually stable and it works great the way it works and you don't want to touch the core code too many times. Um, and so the Taproot upgrade was the last big upgrade that uh, the Bitcoin protocol went through, and that actually was now around two years ago, and the idea is to make transactions more private. And so specifically, the idea was that if somebody wants like open a payment channel or close a payment channel or have another multi-sig transaction that involves two people, that actually gives a lot of away a lot of information. So what it allows you is to actually make multi-signature transactions look like standard peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And that's good for the Lightning Network too, because you want to open or close a payment channel, you can actually hide it as a normal peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Now, um, Taproot enabled also another thing, which I'm not sure seemed to be like uh, planned, but it also led to uh, a big change then in the future. So what it did allow is that people could start storing arbitrary data in a transaction in the witness field. And that's another technical question I have because I think Bitcoin Cash doesn't have a witness field anymore. So I'm not sure if actually um, they could actually um, use um, that upgrade too. But anyway, so the idea is that you can store data directly in a transaction. And so this actually made it possible to um, launch the Ordinals protocol, which happened earlier this year. And the idea there was pretty cool because the idea was that you say we have 100 million sats or satoshis in a Bitcoin and you could actually inscribe data on each of those Satoshis. Um, this actually led to two innovations. First of all, we have the NFTs, ordinal NFTs, and then we have BRC20 tokens. And so ordinal NFTs are similar to NFTs, as we all know, they're non-fungible tokens, so kind of like, re like digital ownable goods. But there's a big difference between NFTs on Bitcoin, Ordinals NFT, and NFTs in Ethereum because, you know, in Ethereum, what you actually do is you use a smart contract and you create a separate token, right? So an NFT is just a co token that has been created by a smart contract and that actually doesn't have the data that represents on-chain. So usually when you have like one of those cool monkey pictures, they're not really on-chain, but they're actually hosted off-chain. And so if somebody actually removes that data, 
So if somebody sells you a Bitcoin on Ethereum, and then 10 years later they stop paying for AWS and the account is closed and the picture is removed, well, the Bitcoin and the NFT is still there, but it doesn't show anything anymore because it points to an empty spot. So NFTs on Ethereum are not really on chain. And that's a big difference for ordinal NFTs because since they're inscribed on Satoshis, they are fully on chain. So there's a four megabyte limitation I've seen. So they say videos potentially. I don't see that really, but uh, maybe a, a GIF or GIF or how you call it. Uh, but the other thing is um, it doesn't require a separate token, right? So it's really a Satoshi um, and, and nothing else. The other use case that um, has arisen later is BRC20 tokens. So we know the ERC20 token standard from Ethereum. And so I think BRC20 is more like a, a play of words. Um, it's an experimental token standard that allows minting and transferring um, of uh, fungible tokens on the Bitcoin network, which is pretty awesome too, because if you think about it, this could really bring a lot of things to Bitcoin, such as security tokens or financial instruments, you name it. Now, again, some people really don't like this. Um, other do, I, I, you know, the choice is yours. But one thing that I want to mention is that BRC20 tokens are not as versatile as their ESC20 counterparts. But on the other hand, they're not as vulnerable to attacks because they're not really held you know, as collateral in smart contracts, etc. Now, these ordinals or the ordinals protocol has um, caused a heated debate in the Bitcoin community because it has increased transaction costs for the first time in a while. But you also see that that spike was kind of short-lived. Um, and so we have now transaction costs of around 190, which I think you know, is pretty fair. It went up to 30, so people got concerned. And, and you know, the core of the debate really is that a lot of people say, look, Bitcoin should remain Bitcoin. That's what it should do. It shouldn't, you know, we don't want to meme coins. You know, we have Ethereum for that. But there's pro, you know, the pro argument, which I, I think you know, makes sense in my limited understanding, is to say, look, as, as long as block rewards are reduced over time, you need transaction fees in order to incentivize miners. Right, and so if fees are at 180 or even lower at one dollar, where's the incentive to do mining, especially in a time where in energy cost is increasing? I guess you know, as many things in crypto, it's kind of a religious debate. So I'll leave it at that. The question again: Are Lightning Node operators subject to Swiss financial market regulation? So now that you know how a Lightning Node works and how payment channels work, we can point out the differences to a normal node, and I think that's the most important part because. For those of you who don't know or, or need a refresher, so um, validators on um, Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, what they basically do, they validate transactions. Um, and what they do is they participate in the network and in the first step they take, you know, they have their own pool with transactions that are, you know, unconfirmed and they take them and put them together in a block. That's their block, how they like it to look like. And then they either are selected in proof of stake randomly or they win, you know, a math riddle are the best at, or the first at uh, doing that in proof of work. And then you get to add the block to the blockchain. Now what they do is they validate the transaction between Alice and Bob, but the transaction doesn't go through them. They just say, Alice sent money to Bob, and that's true, and that's what happened. And that's really it, right? And the Lightning Node is very different, right? Because actually the transactions are routed through the Lightning Node, through those payment channels that they're setting up. And it's really becoming more like an infrastructure service. And another, yes? Oh. Ah, sorry. So, quick question: The LN BTC are considered like assets that are locked in a trust, or is it something different? So, for example, I have one million dollars in Bitcoin. I create a channel with you. I lock that one million dollar Bitcoin. If I do something bad, can that be seized, or is that considered my assets? Is is it considered your assets? Who's uh, that's a good question. I am. Um, I think they cannot be seized. I haven't heard anything alike, like you have in, uh, in proof of stake, where you put stuff at stake and you you know you're you know kind of like punished for dishonest behavior. But I would argue those are your funds, and we get to that point in a second. Okay, um, now another thing is important that when you set up these um, payment channels is that you can decide yourself who you actually want to have a payment channel with. So there's no automation, right? And I, I know that you know you can say, oh, you know, but people can actually put their blocks together the way they like, you know. Yes, yeah, true. But you know, usually it's an automated process, right? It's really just usually based on the traction fee that is paid. Some people wanna have, you know, listening to the OFAC censoring and say some blocks I'm not gonna add. 
I mean, in reality, you know, regular blocks are just really created with uh, an automated mechanism. But, you know, Lightning Node operators, they say, okay, I want to have a Lightning Node, you know, I want to have a Pain Jam with you, and I want to have one with you, and here I want to have five Bitcoin and two Bitcoin. So it's much more kind of, um, much more control in it. And the one last thing is that, you know, they potentially create a new asset, which is LMBTC. Um, so when you look at those questions, are those issues, we have to take a look at token classifications. And here I'm going to do a quick detour about how token functionalities are determined and how they're actually classified. And that's basically our daily work. You know, we used to do it in 2017 before, you know, Finma helped us, but now it's still, we have a lot of clarity on it. But I think what's important for you guys to understand is that, you know, all tokens are based on source code, right? That's a solidity contract, so it's going to look different in a BRC20 token standard. But the idea is the same, right? The code usually does not explain what the token does. It doesn't say, if you come to me, you can actually vote in my General Assembly. You know, it doesn't do that. It basically just says it's a token, that's how it works. The functionalities really are given by overall circumstances. So contracts, one thing, great if you have any. But then also marketing materials, you know, Twitter, you know, everything that you shout out, everything is taken into consideration. If the SEC or FINMA actually looks at your token, they say, wait a minute. But you told in this event, you had a big flag that said, you know, you're going to give them, you know, part of your revenue. Um, um, that also counts, right? So, and also what matters is the actual use of the blockchain token in the marketplace, which sucks a bit, I must say, because the problem is sometimes people actually change how they use your token, and it still affects how the token's classified. Now, we have different classification models. We actually started um, in 2017 with our own internal classification model. It had, it's very legal, you know, as a concept, and I will show it in a sec, just very quickly, but... Um, FINMA actually helped us a lot when they came out in 2018 with the FINMA ICO guidelines. And I would say until this day, and I've talked to a lot of lawyers in other countries, this is really what you know, sets us apart from other jurisdictions. Regulatory clarity, what tokens do and how they're classified. And not only that, FINMA did something that is truly astounding. They said, this is how you classify tokens. Don't bother us. You can. You can come and ask, but you don't have to. This is it. You know, do your assessment, go to a lawyer, go. Now, if you're wrong, you know, we're going to go after you, but still, you don't have to get a license. And that's really an important part. That's really the big difference to the United States, where you say, oh, it's a security, it's not registered, you know, it's a problem. But you want to register, you can't, it's also a problem. So, um, and then we have Mika in 2023. It's going to be, I think, in force really next year or in two years. And it's actually, I think it's great that the European Union did something on this, but it's also, it's very limited. It basically only covers stable coins. Um, it's just something, and like, you know, service providers um, that basically offer like, you know, like custody services or other services, you know, to other jurisdictions that they need to have a license, etc. It's good to do something, but it's really, um, I think FINMA really was, um, you know, did us a great favor in Switzerland. So basically our classification system was based on a simple idea, right? Some tokens have no rights attached at all, like Bitcoin, right? If you own a Bitcoin, what are you going to do? You know, it doesn't say like, oh, I go to you, you owe me now something. No. You don't go to, you know, even if you know who Satoshi is, you don't go to him and say like, you owe me something now. Some tokens do, in, uh, you know, incorporate rights, right? Maybe like a share token. Like you can, you can vote in a company or you can basically get part of the dividends. Or it's an IOU, you know, this token represents, you know, a debt of $1,000. Those are basically the counterparty tokens, the orange one. And then we have, as a concept, the ownership tokens, right? Real ownership, rights against everybody, right? This will be basically your tokenized um, real estate registry, like your house, you know, and you go to the community and it says, okay, who owns house in Contaster 15? And it says, oh, it's address so-and-so, you know, with that token. That is an ownership token. It doesn't really exist yet. I think it only really works if you have registered rights, like, you know, um, home ownership, patents, you know, trademarks, things that basically create ownership towards everybody because they, you know, everybody should look there to understand who owns something. FINMA made it very easy. They started differently. They said, what are the existing financial market regulations? How we can weave them in? And they came up with a very simple approach. They said, there's utility tokens. They're not regulated. You can do with them whatever you want. We have payment tokens. They're used for peer-to-peer -peer payments. And there's a risk of money laundering. So those are subject to the Anti-Money Laundering Act. And then you have asset tokens or security tokens, which are financial instruments or securities, and they already are regulated, so we just use the same regulation for those. And that's it. And this is really helpful 
um, has allowed us to do a lot of ICOs. We never had an issue, so we, I can proudly say we, we, had, we didn't have a single client the last nine years that actually got enforced by FINMA. There were some investigations, but never really um, into the enforcement stage. And here you see the legal situation in the United States, and I think that matters, and you will see, and you probably wonder, why is he talking about all these talks? And you will see in the end. So the idea is that we had, or they had with Jay Clayton, a pretty um, open head of the SEC who said, you know, there's risk, problem, you could lose money, but, you know, let's, let's sit back, let's look how this develops. And Gary Gensler, as I guess most of you know very well, at least by name, uh, he famously said that everything except Bitcoin is a security. Right, that creates a lot of problems for a lot of our clients and also potentially creates problems for the Lightning Network, as we'll see in a sec. So when you look at the status quo, people say it's regulation by enforcement. It's really true. I mean, I've seen it happening uh, day by day. It's a bit of a sad story, but I would also argue that if it wasn't that way, Switzerland and also probably Plan B wouldn't have come into existence because if the Silicon Valley wouldn't have messed up and Ethereum would have done the ICO in Silicon Valley in 2014, it would all be there. So I'm not unhappy, but I still don't really get it why. So, um, so now talking about um, classification of this LMBTC, of this thought construct. So we know that Bitcoins are payment tokens, but uh, FINMA said so in the ISO guidelines as you know, one of two examples. They say Bitcoin and Ether, interestingly, are payment tokens. Um, but what about LMBTC? And, and you know, I would argue um, that they're also payment tokens. Seems to be pretty clear because they're, aff you know, effectively they are Bitcoin. They have the same payment character, and they're obviously intended to um, to be used as a payment for goods and services. Now the key question is, are they also something else? And so the the ICO guidelines and FIMA says, you know, a token can be many things. It can be a, a utility token and a security. It can be a payment token and a utility token. So here the question is, is that all? And I think, yes, it is all. Uh, most importantly, it's not a security and not a derivative. I don't have to go into details. But the point is, the security under Swiss law has a right attached to it. And we are very glad that this concept that we introduced very early on with our BCP paper finally got some traction. And even though FINMA never really publicly wrote about it, they have admitted in the meantime that, yes, a security token without a legal right attached to it that allows you to claim something from the issuer does not exist. And the derivative, it's also not, because they're basically the same asset. And so if it's the same asset, it's not an underlying asset that has a derivative component. It's just the same. Also, you don't really spin up a node to hedge or to other things that you would do um, that, you use a, that you would use a derivative transaction for. So now we know LMBTC and Bitcoin, they're both payment tokens. So what does this mean? Now, if you actually have payment tokens in this system and you participate in that system, just four potential consequences for you from a regulatory perspective. So the first is you might issue a means of payment, which is you know, subject to the Anti-Money Laundering Act because you issue LMBTC by depositing Bitcoin. The other thing is you might be operating a payment system, also subject to the Anti-Money Laundering Act and maybe even subject to licensing by FINMA. You might perform a payment transaction service, which I think is, you know, um, happens very quickly. I mean, I'll talk about that in a second. Or you might even be considered as a bank, you know, that accepts public deposits. Now, I think that none of these apply. And I'm not the only one. So my friend at Bitcoin Swiss, who wrote about this as well, is the same opinion. The idea is that you don't really issue a means of payment if you don't really increase the amount in circulation. Right? And so, because Bitcoin and LMBTC are basically the same thing, and it's the same amount, you cannot really talk about an issuance. Even if you did, it's really an issuance to yourself. And that answers your question, I believe, because the point is you actually deposit and you get NMBTC and then you can use them. It's kind of like go to the casino, give money and get you know, tokens to use. It's kind of it's yours. You, you do issue for yourself. The other thing is I don't think you operate a payment system. And you know, payment system regulation in Switzerland is pretty weird. I can say that. It's not very clear, but I mean, there's a few aspects that must be present for a payment system. So one thing that the Anti-Money Laundering Act says is that it's a regulated payment system if it's operated by somebody else than the users. So if the operator and the users are the same person, it's not a payment system. And this is what we have with direct payments. So if I make direct payments with you and I have a payment channel and we basically just do this, you know, we maybe operate, but we also use, so it's all good. The other thing is about routing, and this is where it gets a bit more complicated. Now, one thing that 
the law requires and actually says in the definition, it says a payment system allows users to access a credit balance. And again, the concept is, okay, if I'm the operator of my payment channel, then I basically allow others to access a balance that nah, doesn't really work, right? So I don't think that that really applies either. So I think operation of a payment system wouldn't really make much sense because you know the, the consequence really would be you have to identify not just people interacting with you, but everyone, right? How you do that? You can't. So I don't think Finma would ever go there, um, but we have been surprised in the past. So um, I also think that as a logical consequence of that, you also don't need a license for a payment system because you're not a payment system. You need a license when you're actually really important that actually happened to, uh, what's the name, the Facebook coin, Libra. So Libra wanted to actually be a payment system and they will be really important. Obviously people don't want Facebook to, you know, they said, ah, that's a payment system that needs a license and you know, then things get a bit shaky. Who has a payment system license besides six in Switzerland? I think six. I'm not sure of anybody else. So only six. Okay. Um, I think so. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I have another short question regarding compliance. Yes. Uh, if I'm engaged in a lightning operation with somebody that is a bad actor, how does this affect me? Uh, if I started the, it's more of a philosophical question, but if that, that address is on a sanction list or gets on a sanction list, um, five days or one week after I initiated the um, uh, interaction with, with that, well, how will that affect me? Or So, you know, to answer it in, in, in two stages, you know, the, the point of this assessment is to understand are you subject to the anti money laundering act or other regulations? Because if you're not, you don't have to bother. Now, sanctions always apply, right? So that's a good point because you don't need to be like, but, you know, Coop also has to comply with sanctions, you know, and Kim Jong-un goes by, you know, guys, Brett, you know, they don't check him either. So it's kind of like, it's a difficult field. But the other answer is, I think it's a technical question. Can you, how can you, you know, can you create thresholds, like rules of engagement with your payment channel? I don't know, right? That might be a good idea. And we get to that point in a second, why this might actually help in the future. Another thing that I want to talk about, which I think is probably the one thing that a lot of people would be most concerned about, is it actually a payment transaction service? So payment transaction service is if, if Alice pays to Bob and I help Alice. Usually I take Alice's money and I give it to Bob, like a bank, right? That is a traditional idea of a payment transaction service, which is always custodial. At least it used to be custodial until two years ago. We'll get to that in a second. But in a custodial payment transaction service, you need to have power of disposal over the assets, right? And this is not the case here because due to the atomic nature of the swap, you never actually get power of disposal. It either goes through to Eric or it stays with Alice. But if you're Bob, you never have power of disposal at all. So you cannot mess up, you cannot steal, you cannot do anything. So that doesn't apply either. Now, what about non-custodial payment transaction services? And this is kind of a difficult one that was introduced, you know, by, um, by the Swiss legislator two years ago. They said, and this is really true, they said, it is so difficult um, to understand all these smart contracts and it's also you know, nitty gritty. And this argument that you need to have custody um, in every case to be a payment transaction service providers, does no longer apply. You can now also be an intermediary and therefore subject to the Anti Laundering Act if you help transfer virtual assets and you have an ongoing relationship with the party. Which is weird, and people wrote about it and they said it doesn't really work that way, and you cannot really, on an ordinance, so you know, there's the Constitution, there's a law, there's the ordinance, and they introduced that in the ordinance, which is questionable. It's also very unclear. But also, you know, when we look at the literature that has been created on this question, it says, okay, sure, I mean, you help, but how do you help? Like, and, and really what's crystallizing out is that the help need to be done by somebody who has an ability to influence transaction. That's also in the use cases that the Federal Council mentioned in their big DLT report. But here we would also argue that given the atomic nature and um, you don't really have an ability to influence transaction. Now, there's a little asterisk because you can wind down your node, right? But that just means you're just not going to be used, right? So the point is you cannot really intermediate, just can avoid being used, but you cannot really 
you know, influence the transaction. Now, yes, you could make the argument, yes, I do influence it, right? Because now it goes another way. But I think that goes a bit too far. So again, also not applicable. And the last one, um, are you a bank? You know, the Banking Act in Switzerland is also written very interestingly different than in most countries. Actually, it says pretty much every repayment obligation that you have qualifies as a public deposit, and you're not allowed to take public deposits unless you're a bank. Now, there's various exceptions, but we don't have to go to the exceptions because actually here also the idea is you don't ever receive money from others, so you don't have a repayment obligation. And more than that, even, even if you go bankrupt, and that's the whole purpose of the Banking Act, that in case of a bankruptcy that your creditors are protected, here, if you um, go are wound down, nobody loses their money, right? Because you never have any. So this means, I guess, that's the good news. As a Lightning Node operator, you are not subject to the Swiss financial market regulations. This means you don't have to do KYC. This means you don't have to register. You're good to go. Now, we talked about ordinals, and we talked about BRC20 tokens. The tricky thing here is that the ordinals protocol has enabled the creation of other tokens, right? Which means people could come and say, I'm going to tokenize Tesla shares, and I'm going to use the Lightning Network to transfer them. And it's not very far-fetched when you think about it, right? Because the Lightning Network in and of itself is a great idea. It does work. And so if people actually come up with other use cases, you know, they might be implemented. The problem here is that we have the risk of being classified as a security settlement system. And FINMA is very strict here. I know that from my experience with clients, when we talk to them, they don't play around here. They say, look, everybody who is involved in the security transaction settlement is a security settlement system. Right? There's a lot of arguments that don't really work. For example, they say, well, you know, um, people could just, you know, take another route. You know, if I fall off, you know, I'm not essential. I'm not, you know, I'm not a critical part. They say, mm -mm, doesn't matter. If you actually are used and it's routed through there and it settles a security transaction, you're in. Which means you need to have one of two licenses. You need to be a central security depository or a DLT trading system. Both of them are obviously not possible to obtain by every single node. Also, it would fracture the landscape. Those in Switzerland, you know, would require a license. Those abroad wouldn't. But it would actually mean that Swiss people cannot do it. Now, I know that the risk of enforcement is not very high. But I think, you know, it is, as lawyers, our legal obligations to assess based on the facts. And even though the enforcement risks are low, I think it's important to um, think about it. Because another argument that speaks against Node operators is the fact that they really choose themselves whether they want to open a payment channel and with what tokens and with whom. So especially large node operators should think about that twice. And I'm mainly thinking about custodial wallet operators that are large nodes with a lot of payment channels and that say people, you come to me, you know, just deposit your funds and you can actually do all these things. If they are in Switzerland, I would say they should be very careful and talk to us. <laughs> um, another thing I want to quickly just, um, it's, the it's the last slide actually. I'm not sure, I hope I'm not too much over time. But anyway, so um, what about custodial and uh, non-custodial Lightning wallets? So generally providing non-custodial wallets is not a problem as long as the following requirements are met. You must not be able to access funds of the users, well, which means they would be custodial. But you must also not be able to prevent withdrawal, right? Which means you cannot take them, but you can basically avoid them being taken. That's enough. Now, another thing you're not allowed to do is basically being able to influence transactions for the reason I mentioned before about this new change in the law. As long as those uh, two are not met, you should be fine. I mean, in the end, it's really just a software that you're offering and you don't really have any type of control. People just use it and lose their keys and then lose their funds. The other thing is the talking about custodial Lightning wallets. Here, things are pretty clear. Um, if you have a custodial wallet for Bitcoin and you have custody, you're subject to the Anti-Money Laundering Act. Now, what I never told you, but the Anti-Money Laundering Act means you have to identify every single customer. You have to establish source of wealth. You have to establish source of funds. You have to join a self-regulatory organization. You have to have a customer profile. You have to do transaction monitoring. So it's a lot of stuff you got to do. It's really not, and it's just not scalable, right? Anytime the Anti-Money Laundering Act is triggered, you spend 
tens and tens and tens of francs on every user, right? So you never get to a million users that way. Um, the other thing, though, is when you have Bitcoin and you pool them on chain, you also need a banking license. So um, I guess it's something that all custodial wallet operators know by now, but still good to keep in mind. The last thing, what about Bitcoin trading services? If you have a wallet that actually offers Bitcoin trading services, there you do have a threshold of $1,000 per month. It was a long time unclear if it's per day, is it per month? It's actually per month, unfortunately. But as always with these thresholds, you know, they sound great, but the problem really is you cannot say, well, up to 1,000 per transaction is fine. You need to make sure that that person actually doesn't make more than one transaction in that amount per month, which means you need to identify them anyways, right? Which, in the end, doesn't help you all that much. Um, that's already it. And I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Since you were asking, like, can I receive one Bitcoin uh, without depositing it? Uh, yes, you can. So okay. if, if my node opens a channel to your node of one Bitcoin, then you can receive one Bitcoin. And it's also how uh, non-custodial wallets are doing it, like Phoenix. They run a node on your phone, and if you and you can immediately receive one Bitcoin if you want over Lightning, and they do this by opening a channel to you with that capacity. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they actually provide the capacity and then already. Yeah. Either they do it for free or they charge like a dollar or two for the for the service because there's an on-chain transaction needed for it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. I mean, I guess as people are online, maybe, I don't know. I'm sorry, you can. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, so Bitcoin Lightning uh, payments, they are not traceable on a blockchain. There's no, uh, there's no blockchain explorer to, to trace the transactions and we cannot actually see them. So it makes them very private. Uh, and there is no uh, blockchain analytics that will analyze the analytics tool that would analyze blockchain uh, lightning network uh, payments and uh, that makes them actually even more private than uh, let's say zcash or monero and no uh, decent financial institution in switzerland would uh, offer the services of monero and zcash because of their high risk uh, for the money laundering but there is no such uh, objection against uh, Bitcoin Lightning payments. So what do you think about um, these uh, risks of uh, Bitcoin Lightning payments from the money laundering perspective? On, or do these payments present like a very high risk um, for the regulatory uh, reasons? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. I think... Um Technically, I'm not sure. I, my understanding was that with the, the Taproot update, the additional privacy, that you can actually hide the transaction and make it look like a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. I think even if you run it, you know, through a scanner, you just simply don't know, right? And so that's a bit of difference. You know, when you do a normally a chain, an, 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 a chain analysis, you see, okay, there's something popping up. These were, you know, interact with a mixer, and this is something that happened there. But if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. That's the, the, the first answer. The other thing is that... AML is a bit special in a sense that you need to make sure that you have an AML guideline in place that avoids you being misused for money laundering. But how you do this is oftentimes a bit up to you, right? You know, some service providers, they, you know, they say we do three hops, we do five hops, we do 20 hops to see like, you know, what was the history of those coins. And, and Finma doesn't say this is how you do it. They basically give a lot of leeway. You just have to make sure that it's a, a, a good process, that it approved by the SRO, and that you actually follow it, which I think is much more important. Um, now, personally, what I don't really get, and you know, I know people don't always agree with this, I think you know the concept of technology neutrality that you know Switzerland always talks about is really not present here. Because when I actually use cash, which I know is very limited, but if I go with cash to a bank, they don't say, who held that cash, you know, five transactions ago? And I was like, well, I don't care. <laughs> well, that's just my money. I sold a painting and, you know, I have 10,000 Swiss francs here. And they will say, yeah, that's fine. And with, you know, on-chain, because they can't check, they will. 
right? And the reason for that, I believe, is that Finma initially said, yeah, this crypto stuff, onboarding, AML, that doesn't really work. But then people actually came, and I think it's also people in my firm that push for this, that says, no, 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 wait, wait. It's actually fine because we can actually do chain analysis. And they said, oh, well, great. Then if you can do it, then do that. Mm -hmm. Created a lot of problems, especially onboardable, not onboard funds that cannot be onboarded. And um, I don't think that if that answers your question, but I do believe that if there's no visibility on chain, you don't have to follow it. And even if there was visibility on chain, it's really up to the intermediary to decide how they want to deal with it. Gentleman over there. Second. Yeah, he. So no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, so <laughs> super quick one. Uh, I think earlier you mentioned OFAX when checking whether something was uh, <coughs> illegal. I've never heard of that before. I couldn't Google it. Could you maybe? OFAC. OFAC, okay. Yeah. And that's part of the sort of. Office of Foreign Asset Control of the like United States government. Yeah, I know. They actually are the ones that actually um, sanctioned uh, Tornado Cash. Okay, okay. They said, actually, you know, I mean, they are in a very interesting move they said we don't only sanction individuals and, and companies we sanction now smart contracts and so they actually sanctioned smart contracts so actually this was a big debate in the ethereum community at least because the question was most as i said before most blocks are not manually set together they're kind of like established based on software and you know there was a uh, quite a large percentage i think over 50 almost 50%, I'm not sure you know how much it was, that said we are actually processing blocks OFAC compliant. So if there's a transaction that touches Tornado Cash, because they couldn't kill Tornado Cash, that's not possible, it's there on chain. But what they can do is that Tornado Cash transactions are just not processed anymore by default. And so um, that's the idea, yeah, that some of them actually listen to OFAC, but the majority right now doesn't, which I think is a good, a good thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, how can the use of ordinals or similar projects provide uh, incentives for miners over time? Can transaction fees serve as a reward system for the miners? I think so. I think, uh, you know, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you have two you know, sources of revenue. You have inflation, which decreases over time, and transaction fees. On the other hand, you have increasing, you know, electricity costs. So I know, at least from reading, that in the bear market 1819, some miners actually acted in a deficit because, you know, they just still wanted to offer the service. And if you actually say we have an amazing capacity and we can actually now increase block size to, I don't know, five gigabytes, even if you could, you know, it just question is would it really be worth it so the argument there goes that actually increasing transaction fees is what actually makes the blockchain survive okay, thank you another quick one sorry i'm trying to That's pick good. up your brain That's a good. bit please, please. Uh, and i have That's this question because, for. <laughs> because uh, i'm working as a consultant and sometimes my client asks me a lot of questions which i cannot answer so i'm trying to to figure out another important fact which is not really imposed at the moment but might be imposed is about taxation how do you think i don't i don't know if there's a legal opinion on this out there but how do you think the tax authorities will look like will look at the bitcoins locked in a channel. Is it my bitcoin? Do I have to declare it as a liability, as an asset? Is it, um, how would you categorize it? So you talk about wealth tax. I think it's taxable. Doesn't matter in what you know shape or form. I guess it's pretty clear. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's obviously clear that Switzerland's the leader now, in, at least compared to uh, United States and Europe in terms of the flexibility and, and, and ease to do all this stuff. But don't you see like the parallels of what happened in private banking where Switzerland was, you know, they had certain laws and this was in, embedded in the Swiss constitution. The United States came and overnight they changed their laws and everyone that was caught in that had to come out. And the same thing with the Switzerland's neutrality, right? Ukraine happened and Switzerland overnight gave up their neutrality. So being... In the center of Europe, obviously, if Brussels says one thing, we see over and over again Switzerland snapping into place in the United States every 30 years coming back for more money. Um, don't you see that as a risk for a lot of people that go into this and, um, and say, okay, you can do it. FINMA said you can do it, but then you, know, you couldn't do it. You know, and, you, and you, go into, you end up with regulatory problems with other countries. 
Do you see that as a risk for? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I hope not. But no, I, I just see the movie being played over and over again. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's a very legitimate question. So I think two, two thoughts you know, that I have. First of all, you know, even if FINMA says you're good to go, FINMA only has jurisdiction in Switzerland. And this is, by definition, not a national technology. So no matter what you do and where you domicile and what licenses you have, you will in inevitably touch other jurisdictions. And there it always has been the only, you know, unsatisfying answers that we give to clients, you offer your service to Germany, you have to talk to Bafin, you go to America, you have to talk to the SEC, you know, that's just something that will not change. Um, what will change in Mika at least is that at least you have a unified European market where you can say you're going to set up a company in Liechtenstein, which is going to be our preferred go-to jurisdiction to actually for passporting of securities and of services that is set up a subsidiary or kind of like another company that actually provides that service for the European users and then basically can act from Liechtenstein into the whole uh, European uh, market. Um, but I think it's a really good question that you ask. And look, honestly, the way that I know um, the Swiss government, like how this actually came to be has a lot to do with players that fought hard for this and Ueli Mura, or Ueli Maura who actually was in the federal council and really fought for this, you know, and he, you know, obviously everybody has shortcomings, but this is something that I think, you know, the space can be really grateful for because he pushed this and says, we're going to do this. And I think it's not a surprise that he came from the same party that also fought, you know, for the banking secret to remain in place that actually is willing to take a fight, you know, with others more than um, probably other parties. But, you know, without being political, I don't think that the government would have the spine to protect these rules if there's international pressure. It's, it's not important enough. You look at how the banking secret, you know, fell. This is going to fall like this. But again, I don't think it's going to happen. Honestly, it's just likeliness because like one thing that I can say is that the United States is really active in enforcement. There hasn't been a single Swiss company enforced by the SEC. Not a single one. And the reason for that is when I talk to securities lawyers in the United States, they often say that this has a lot to do with the fact that they get, give a lot of deference to the United to Switzerland. They say, look, I mean, Switzerland is not, you know, and, you know, a banana republic, you know, if you will. Like, it is really a country that has a strong history, a strong financial market. They have FINMA, which they know, they work with FINMA, and they talk, you know, they have meetings, and they basically say, look, FINMA probably has this under control. And so um, I guess that's why they're really not interested in using tax money going after Swiss customers. But there's no guarantee, of course.